Here are our top 5 TCGs. Magic the Gathering isn't on this list, but this is still my love letter to Wizards of the Coast. Stick around to number 1 and see why. A fake Pokemon ripoff? Nah, <laughs> well yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> could you imagine the board meeting when they came up with a name for Digimon? <laughs> <laughs> if I could be a fly in the wall for that conversation. Alright guys, Nintendo's absolutely smashing it with this Pokemon thing at the moment, so we need to come up with something here at Bandai. Uh, you know, they've got the Pokemon, po Pokemon, po Pokemon Monsters, I don't know what it is, I don't know. I just, <laughs> But what we can do is something like really cool, you know, like really cool, like it was tying into our digital stuff, like the Tamagotchi or something like that. Yeah. Work with me, guys. Work with me. You know, like digi digital monsters, di Digimon, ah, something not as crap as Digimon, but I'm sure you guys will work out. Cool. Cool factor, guys. Digimon work for everyone else? Bezmon, what do you think? Hey, yeah, that sounds like me. What about you, Deck Buildemon? Buildex, oh, I must build decks, build decks, yes, build decks, my precious building decks. Oh, yeah, yeah, more decks to build, build more decks, yeah, more decks, more decks. <laughs> Digimon was released in 1997 originally as this Tamagotchi style product. Yeah, the name is kind of similar to Pokemon, and yeah, it's kind of about collecting monsters and evolution, <laughs> but I promise you the similarities in there. We grew up in the 90s. And one of my earliest memories of Digimon was probably around about 1999 with the anime. I don't know if you remember the anime, but it absolutely rocked. You know what? I, I, I got into it a little bit late. I had a friend of mine um, who's probably not watching this video, but he introduced me to Digimon well after I was like really, really into Pokemon. And I was blown away by it when I saw it. I was like, wow, this is so cool. This is so <laughs> much cooler than Pokemon. I know it was. It really was. Digimon has gone through so many different versions, but in 2021, we got the best version to date. One of the absolute greatest mechanics I've seen to date when it comes to management of your resources is in Digimon. It's this memory gauge system where it's an inverse tug of war. There's added complexity in the game because of the memory gauge system, where it's how much am I going to give my opponent? How little am I going to give my opponent? really have to think hard about these things. Pay for your cards using the sliding scale and as soon as you move across to your opponent's side on that scale, their turn begins immediately. Memory gauge gives you really quick turns and gives a flow to the game that I've never seen in any other TCG. The other thing about the game that I really love is its egg deck. It's a separate deck for those situations when you just have nothing to play in your hand, you've always got your egg deck. You hatch the egg, leave it in the incubator on the next turn, the egg comes out and it's cost you no memory whatsoever. To win the game, get your opponent's memory stack to zero and then go for the kill shot. So in Magic, you have a system of land. To get the land, you have to draw it. Don't draw the land. You don't have the land, therefore you don't have the resources to pay for the cards. In Digimon, you'll never be in a situation where you can't pay for a card you really want to play. Digimon is probably one of the easiest trading card games to just pick up and get going with but very hard to master. Unlike Yu-Gi-Oh, no extreme long turns. The game has also been really well supported over the last three years with multiple expansions coming out and multiple core sets. We're at core set 15 right now. Digimon only has two cons for me. It's probably not the most original game to come out from Bandai Studios with some similarities between Pokemon with the life points and evolution. And the only other con I have is if you want to play competitively in the UK, you really need to be in a major city. Yeah, there's kind of a nostalgia factor for me as well in this. I remember ages 11 to kind of 13, watching the anime, collecting the cards. But the main important part for any TCG is the mechanics and how solid they are. I think I was, the, the most impressive thing for me about the whole system is going to be that tug of war. I, feel, yeah. I don't feel like there's any other TCGs that have really done that. Like, all right, I, I see your point that it's not the most, you know, inventive TCG in the whole world. But that tug of war part kind of is. Yeah, it's so cool. It really defines it, and and you know it, it sets it apart from from everything else. Yeah. And you know my my Pokemon League players are probably gonna hate me for this, um, but I actually prefer Digimon to Pokemon. <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna go out and say it. So I always recommend it over Pokemon, and I know a lot of people might give me stick for that, but it is a better game. The support for Pokemon is kind of nuts, and and that sort of audience that it attracts. I don't think Pokemon is gonna go anywhere anytime soon for the reason that two guys with beards 
I've said it online. Yeah. But you should try. You should try Digimon. Yeah, it's try it's Digimon. so. It's a fantastic game. It's also a very easy game to pick up and play. Just quickly learn. If you already play the TCGs, this is going to be something that just flows very natural for you. You, you just want to flow with things. You just want to go with, you know, go with it. Just go with the flow. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, yeah, I think it does too. Yeah. The cards themselves, the stock is absolutely amazing. I don't know if you remember the Digimon card stock. Yes, I do definitely remember it. Like, seriously, Wizards Magic. of the Coast, please take a page of Bandai's book. Their stock is amazing. Their seriously, please lovely. do something like that. I, know. I do really feel that Bandai's taken, um, is taking Japanese TCGs in a new direction where Japanese TCGs sort of historically have been really text heavy on cards. Look at Yu-Gi-Oh as a perfect example of this, right? And Bandai has kind of been like this in the past. You can say what you want about Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball Super, the original one, right? The, the Master series. Yeah. But they, they really sort of learned a lesson with Digimon. They're like, you know, we're going to streamline this. We're going to make this approachable for people to play. Also, it's only been around for three years. So it's an easy kind of game to jump onto. You're not worried about a huge back catalog of cards that you need to know and understand. There's also a lot of variability within that, you know, considering that it's only three years old. Yeah, the meta is kind of defined by probably a couple of decks, but I think it's an absolutely solid, solid game. And that is why Digimon is, for me, one of my favorite games of all time. <laughs> table number two? Yeah, table oh, number two. two. Yeah. Nice to be. Nice yeah. to be. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'm quite a casual gamer. Oh, yeah, me, me too. Oh. No, I don't just take it too seriously. It's not just about fun for me. Yeah, I love casual games. Yeah. I'm playing... Uh, Vegeta, uh, Xeno and Trunks. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah I, I suppose you really are casual, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, very casual. Yeah, I mean, it's just a pre-con deck, this thing. Yeah. Is yours pre-con? Uh, no, no, I've upgraded it a bit. Yeah. Just, just a couple of upgrades, okay, yeah. yeah nothing good. too serious. Nothing pretty too casual. Yeah, that's good, that's good. A few moments later. Yes, it's another Bandai game. Yes, it's based on another anime IP, but hear me out on this one. Dragon Ball is one of the largest franchises in the universe, and it has been part of me since as long as I can remember. That's already one box ticked for me. What Dragon Ball has over Digimon is complexity. I mean, just look at the amount of text on that card. <laughs> In Dragon Ball, you have a leader card similar to commander cards in Magic the Gathering, which once a certain condition is met, they will flip over to their awakened side and become super powerful. And using that leader card and other characters that you're gonna play onto the table, you will battle your opponent and take their life down to zero to win the game. Another one of my favorite mechanics from Dragon Ball is the dual purpose of each of your cards. You can either play the card onto the table or flip that same card upside down and use it to pay for other cards. So my pros of the game, Dragon Ball Super is a very advanced game and this might be absolutely perfect for those looking for a very competitive scene. It's been supported since 2017, so you have a huge pool of cards to build your decks with. On the complexity of the game, you get deep decision making. I remember when I was eight years old and seeing Goku go Super Saiyan for the first time. It still gives me goosebumps till today. Combos galore and Yu-Gi-Oh levels of complexity this game kicked off the golden age for Bandai. The main issues I have with the game is it's hard to jump onto due to its complexity. It has a dwindling player base and the gap between a pro player and a new player is absolutely massive. But if those are issues for you, then maybe Dragon Ball Fusion is the way to go. Dragon Ball Super Card Game will still exist as the Master Series, but they're also bringing us Fusion World. Fusion is focused at more newer players bringing us a more streamlined game with less complexity. But I'll talk about that more once I've played it. And no, I'm serious. It, it just keeps going off the shelf. I, I can't even hold one for myself at the moment. Yes, the nostalgia thing is a factor for me. 
And we're probably going to see a bit of a reoccurring theme with that as well with myself. But this is a deep game with incredible complexity. And I'm really looking forward to what they do with Fusion World and the Master Series. I'm really excited for it too. I, I wish it had more of a player base. I think that's probably my biggest issue with Dragon Ball. I think if it had a bigger player base, I would definitely get involved. That being said, Fusion World sold like absolute nuts. There's so much hype behind Fusion World at the moment. I'm really excited to see Dragon Ball have a resurgence. Probably my favorite anime of all time. I, I don't think I can really think of any, any like shonen anime at least that I, I adore more than Dragon Ball. Like that is the anime of my childhood. I think it's probably true for you, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, of course, we're going to have to put Dragon Ball on this list. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah. The Master Series, I think, is great because it allows me to continue to play the game I know. And with Fusion, it might allow me to then introduce friends or new people into a game and a world I love. Dragon Ball really gives me this feel of this huge, epic battle between these two big, powerful beings. I mean, what other game lets you go Super Saiyan and have matchups between characters like Goku and Freezer? Mind blown. I present to you Lokana! Love TCGs! Wow, all these TCGs are mine? But what about that shadowy place over there? That is MetaZoo. You must never play it. Delve into the magical world of Disney animation as a powerful luminist. What are you laughing at? <laughs> 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 By manipulating powerful ink and through your Locana force, yes, these are real things, assemble your team of magical and sometimes reimagined fantastical characters. The aim of the game is to collect law and slow your opponent down from doing the same. The first to 20 law wins. One of my favorite things about Locana is its law system. No other TCG really does anything as such. This brings us a whole new world into trading cards where it's no longer about combat, about fighting one another. It's more about collecting resources and the first one to collect those resources wins. And the resource management system for paying for your cards is also very similar to Dragon Ball, but I think does something very interesting. You once again have a dual purpose of your card where you can either play the card or flip the card over and use it as ink. Ink is the system by which you pay for the cards. Out the box, from day one, you had a supported multiplayer format for Lokana. We have in Magic Commander, where you have a more sociable experience of playing TCGs, which isn't often the case with trading card games. But here, grab three of your friends and get playing straight away. The law system feels a lot less negative, but don't worry. If killing your opponent is your thing, then you can still destroy your opponent's characters and slow them down. It's not a TCG unless you're making your opponents cry. Another one of the pros of the game is this ongoing damage system. Uh, you'll put a counter onto your character card and the damage accumulates over time. Unlike magic where an attack will happen and then that's it. You're, all of a sudden your characters are back up and healthy like nothing ever happened, not in this game. That damage will stay permanent and over time those characters become weaker until they are destroyed. Finally, Lokana is a very easy system to learn which still gives you some very interesting decision making. Cons. We're still definitely in the early phase of the game with only a few sets released, so it still feels a little bit limited, but I really can't wait to see which way this game goes. The first set was also fairly small with only 200-ish cards, which didn't quite feel enough variability for a first set where you're used to seeing about 300 or so cards. So yeah, maybe that could have been done a bit different. Some may also find the color system lacking in flexibility, where you are tied down to only having a maximum of two colors in your deck. In Magic, you can go from anywhere from one to five colors and anywhere in between when building decks. And one minor con from myself is its focus on a younger audience, well, which might be a positive for parents looking to play something with their kids. Yeah, it's probably no surprise I've picked another animation themed TCG, but this one really got me hooked. I was initially hesitant as I thought maybe it's more collector's type of trading card game, but it was a proper game. We ended up playing the starter decks, we ended up playing some three, four player games of it. It quickly got my attention. I, I was surprised by Lokana. I thought from all of the previews that it came across as like a magic clone, like which lots of TCGs are kind of doing in the space, but, right? Yeah. But Lokana actually didn't really feel that much like magic to me. It felt like quite a different system. It, took elements from Magic and took elements from the Bandai TCGs. It feels a little bit different from the TCGs on this list. I think ultimately Lokana is not the game for me. I think I really want a more competitive entire experience. And I don't think Lokana is there quite yet, but 
the popularity behind this is absolutely insane and like good on Ravensburger for for like upping the print runs for this making this accessible bringing down the booster box price you know putting in every shop out there every every trading card shop is pretty much picking this up now and it's bringing new faces in, into stores uh, people you would not expect people who had that childhood of mm. watching mickey mouse and all the amazing like disney animated movies that we watched when we were growing up yeah. who might not be into stuff like anime or magic magic is uh, magic and yugioh are too nerdy for them right but <laughs> it's like you know there's a ccg for everyone and i feel like lokan is kind of bringing people into the space it's the first time i've played a game with my nephews and they've actually enjoyed it well, i was an invite to this game you're not my nephew they're my nephews too <laughs> well you're not the favorite uncle either <laughs> Have you seen any Enchanted Foils yet? I have not, no. Does it go for a lot of money? Yes, is the <laughs> short answer to that. <laughs> Only one of the three major TCGs is doing competitive play right, and that game is Yu-Gi-Oh! Then, if I combine a core of Vikings with a sub-engine of Snake Eyes with three pot of Prosperities, I We'll be the dueling master. Beth, it's six in the morning. Have you been doing this all night? We need to record that tier list video today for the board games. Don't listen to him, Fares. How else will you become the master of Yu-Gi-Oh? If I wasn't banned, you'd have ten copies of me instead of that measly pot of prosperity. I mean, he doesn't even have a whole line of merchandise. But I wouldn't even be able to put ten copies of you in my deck, even if you weren't banned. Shut up, fool, and listen to me. We finish building this deck, and then we burn this whole place down. Right. I'm, uh, I'm gonna go to bed. Well, I guess it's back to the resting place for me, until the next hallucination. Without a doubt, competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! is absolutely killing it. Yu-Gi-Oh! players are in it to win it, and Konami not only knows it, but embraces it. A quick disclaimer for my picks on the list, I love playing TCGs competitively. For me, the whole point in TCGs is that grind, those gruelling defeats, every lesson you learn that toughens you up as a player. Eventually, it amounts to success. And God, is it so rewarding when you finally do get success. Once upon a time, MTG scratched that itch for me. But with ever shifting focus towards its now most popular format, Casual Commander, it left me yearning for a player base that wanted that same experience as me. And it's exactly that reason why Yu-Gi-Oh deserves spot number two. Fundamentally, Yu-Gi-Oh plays quite differently from Magic. It drops lands altogether for a much more combo-centric style of play. Now, MTG has combo decks, but its path to victory often feels really linear. Now, that's not to say that there aren't tough decisions to make in Magic. There are. But Yu-Gi-Oh! takes combo decks to another level. With countless lines to victory and vast amounts of interaction off turn, you're constantly analysing what is the best decision to make. Now, as with all TCGs, Yu-Gi-Oh! is not perfect. Yu-Gi-Oh! is, without a doubt, the single most complex TCG available on the market today. The barrier to entry is high. You need to know how all the different card types work. You need to know spell speed. And then you probably need to remember all the different types of summoning. Um, so that's so so that's normal summons, ritual summons, exe summons, synchro summons, uh, pendulum summons. Um, I, I probably missed something off of the list there, but it's kind of ridiculous how many summons there are. But when you do figure it out, you realize actually most of them are kind of the same thing anyway. But yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh can be a bit much at sometimes. Power creep is also more evident in Yu-Gi-Oh than any other TCG that I've played. And it's probably down to its strict non-rotating nature with a whole 25 years of cards to play with. It becomes inevitable then that to keep the new archetypes interesting and exciting, you'll probably need to make them more powerful as you go along. Contrary to this, it also means you've got 25 years of cards to play with. In a given competitive format in Magic, you probably have around five to 10 decks that you can play around with. In some cases, this number can be even lower than this. I've played standard in Magic where there's been two competitive decks that you can play I, I did a quick Google search before filming this video um, on how many meta decks you could play in Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duels. And I counted 114 even before getting to the Rogue decks. This is insane. The way that Yu-Gi-Oh! has one main supported format allows for this creativity and this many archetypes. The sense of satisfaction I've gained from Yu-Gi-Oh! Is, is, is unlike any of the TCGs. It's rich, it's deep, it's complex. Mm. It's just so thrilling to, to experience as a TCG and you really can't deny that after 25 years 
that Konami has genuinely achieved greatness as a game, right? You get something I do totally respect. It's not a game, as you know, it's not something I've played as much as you. Uh, I know you're incredibly passionate about it. Game which has gone on for this long, probably the second most played TCG, I'd say, on the market. Huge roster of the cards. I know the online platform as well, you know, how they have the entire backlog of cards ready for online play as well. Magic, you could learn something. I understand the complexity of the game. Maybe it's a bit beyond me in that sense, but I absolutely respect that, you know, the game itself. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the smartest of the TCG players seem to be Yu-Gi-Oh players. <laughs> don't take that line out don't say that it's, it's too controversial if i want to get into Yu Gi, have you got a recommendation for me like here's a deck which doesn't have a million combos and triggers yeah i think you you definitely have to be aware that Yu Gi is, is is complex right you have to just come to terms with that but there are some decks that i think are really good starting on points for me the best starting on point was buying that trap tricks deck i bought three copies of it i put them together and i did a tiny little bit of upgrading to it and that deck is just literally so much fun to play. I think it was such a good starting on point. Uh, you know, I, I reached a ceiling with that deck where I thought, actually, you know what, um, I, I want to go into something a bit more deep because the combos in it are reasonably linear. But it is such a good learning experience to, to pick up that deck. And you will win. You will definitely win with that deck, right? Just, I mean, check out our website, right? It's like 25 quid for three of those decks. That is an insanely high value starter product for, for Yu-Gi-Oh. I probably wouldn't recommend the two-player starter product that came out recently. I've seen a few reports of it being slightly, you know, mediocre at best. Um, Team APS did a review on it and I think they made a lot of really good points. I think you just probably have more fun by picking up like a structured deck. Fire Kings has come out recently. We did a video on it recently. That's probably a more advanced deck. If you're looking to, to jump on at a higher point, that's a good place to go into. The other things probably worth mentioning as well is Speed Duels. It's like this alternative format for, for Yu-Gi-Oh! Kind of like, you know, it takes out one of the phases, so you only have one main phase, and then you just attack, kind of like how you play in Pokemon, where, you know, your attack is the end of your turn. And it just tries to simplifies Yu-Gi-Oh! And it tries to streamline the whole experience. And it does a pretty good job of it. I, I think it's a good starting on point, but if you want the full fight experience, pick up Trap deck. I think that's the best starting on point, 100%. I'll be grabbing them. <laughs> oh, three. Three. Yeah, three of them. <laughs> Flesh and Blood is the best TCG on the market right now. Here's why you should be playing it. And then Rafiki, he picks up the Lokanda box. He's like, Lokanda! And everyone's like, yay! And then that's, that's kind of where I got to. Nobody's going to find that funny, Saab. Okay, I'll work on that one. But Flesh and Blood, now I was thinking like a big, huge battle scene, you know, between like the brute dude, what was his name? Reiner. Reiner, yeah, Reiner's there and attacking everyone and ripping heads off. And then I'm working on it. What do you think? You know, I, you know, I feel we need something more serious for Flesh and Blood. Hmm. You know what? Actually, I've got an idea. Dear Magic, this is my love letter to you. With so many TCGs coming out, feeling like adaptations of the MTG system, Flesh and Blood not only came about with a totally unique system, but it grew and matured into one of the best design games in the space, full stop. Flesh and Blood was conceived by XMTG Pro James White, who formed New Zealand-based studio Legend Story Studios. The player base is stronger now than it ever has been, with frequent local level tournaments and huge worldwide championships. So many LGSs have been struggling to attract customers to any MTG events that are even mildly competitive. It's because so many players of that community have shifted over to Flesh and Blood, and it's easy to see why. Flesh and Blood has a system that translates its theme into gameplay mechanics so well. It feels like you're this armored warrior slashing and swinging at your opponent, reacting and parrying every attack coming at you. It's all achieved by a system of using combat chains. Use an attack card on your opponent, and then pitch a card from hand to use it as resources to pay for that attack. Then wait for your opponent to defend, and then have a chance to react. There's no land-based system here. The resources you have are the cards in your hand. So contrary to most of the TCGs where you gradually ramp up and finally get that devastating blow in, in Flesh and Blood, you start off really strong and then you get chipped away at it. You feel weaker as you, as you progress through the game until you finally get those cards in your hand, that perfect combo, and you deal that devastating final blow. Flesh and Blood also doesn't have a color pie system. 
It uses a hero and class system. You can choose to play a variety of different classes, each with their own strengths and benefits. Within the various classes, you also have different heroes, each with their own special hero powers. Even only after 5 years of this game running, there are so many heroes to try out. Heck, even the prof from Telarian Community College is a hero in this. Throughout this video, you might have got the impression that I don't like MTG. That's not true. I adore magic. I love it as a game and a subculture of society. I feel strongly a part of that community that is Magic the Gathering. The community that's carried it for this 30 years that it's existed. But being so heavily involved in this community, it's given me some really strong opinions of the subject matter. Every announcement from Wizards of the Coast comes across as tone deaf. The ever increasing price. The ever reducing accessibility. And the increasing exclusivity to the highest bidder. Forgetting that. It's people like you and me that have been carrying and embracing this game for 30 years. It's probably unfair to blame the people at Wizards of the Coast, as there's clearly designers under that roof that love and adore this game just as much as I do. But there's others under that umbrella of Hasbro that wish to exploit our community for their own benefit. Legend Story Studios gets this. I think they felt the same way that we felt. I think they felt the same frustrations that I and so many others in this community felt. So they made this game for us, and oh boy, did they make one hell of a game. And that is why Flesh and Blood is easily my number one on this list. <laughs> <laughs> that was intense. Yeah. Um, I think we've just lost our WPN registration. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be silly. Wizards of the Coast not watching this video. That's true. Um, yeah, I think I had a lot to say about magic and... I clearly do, because I, I, I love it so much. And I think I'm just expressing frustration of, of our community here. And I, I hope that resonated with some people that are watching this. I think there are people that feel like, feel like probably me and you on this one. But that's what makes Flesh and Blood so great. Mm. It's because they, they really addressed that game to us. And they're just getting everything right in that game. Like, I, I feel like they can't do any wrong. Like, I had my issues with it when they were doing, like, the whole Unlimited and First Edition thing. And I was kind of like, ah, oh, you know what? I, I don't personally want that. I feel like... It's giving more reason for the collectors to try and take it over and they weren't quite balancing that whole collectors versus players. Mm. And they're like, all right, we'll scrap that. We'll do it a bit more like how Magic does it, right? Mm. So there's no first edition, no ultimate edition. It's just, you know, the print run and yeah, they, yeah. They'll, they'll fix the print run. And, you know, they, they put these coal foils in it. Like you, yeah. you, you, you buy a case and you're probably going to get one of these coal foils or a couple of these coal foils. You sell that and you can make most of your money back if you get like a decent coal foil. Yeah. So it's like, it's supporting the collectors, it's supporting the players, it's doing everything amazingly. It's, it's cheap enough to, yeah. to like build a deck. All right, some some, some things can be a little bit expensive. You know, I had the experience with you know, my my Dramai deck, my, my Dragons deck. Yeah. If you got coal foil and expensive versions of those dragons, that deck would be just ridiculous. Yeah, but it wasn't that expensive when you, you got the cheaper versions. The cheap versions of the dragons? Yeah. Near enough nothing, yeah. you know, a couple of quid. I think th that's kind of the, the route that Yu-Gi-Oh takes with it as well, because they have all the different sort of rarities, secret rares, quartz and hero rare, and all those, right? You can you can you can totally pimp out your deck and get like QCR versions of all your Ash Blossoms. Mm. You don't have to. Yeah. And Yu-Gi-Oh can be relatively affordable, mm. not including Fire Kings. Yeah. I know there's some people probably gonna drop some comments down below, like Fire Kings isn't cheap. <laughs> um, all right, that deck's expensive, but there's a lot of cheap decks, a lot of affordable decks. Mm. It's the same with. Flesh and Blood. Yeah. With Flesh and Blood, Magic the Gathering, these are two things I am passionate about myself as well. But just, it'd be interesting to know your opinion on what you think would be a good starter product. You know what? All the Blitz decks that I played are really, really good. I think just because we almost have a matching name, you should totally get the Fire deck. He literally put a Z at the end to make it F-A-I-Z, Fez. Which is, which is how he actually spelled my name. Yeah. <laughs> In all seriousness, those Blitz decks are so affordable and the fact that they used to put specialization cards in them is kind of nuts, right? Mm. So I think on, on that note, I probably would recommend some of the older ones more so than the newer ones because mm. they're not like a specialization card, which is usually like this ultimate power that you have for, for your deck. Yeah. They've dropped them, but it doesn't mean that the, the Blitz decks are rubbish. They're also really good. Yeah. I think probably the best decision to make is go with the one that you think looks the coolest. They're really easy to get a hold of. It's such a good starting one point for, for Flesh and Blood. They've got this multiplayer format called Ultimate Pit Fight. If you're a fan of Commander, 
this is immediately going to appeal to you. I sat down with my usual commander group recently and I said to them, look guys, we're playing Ultimate Fit Fight. We need, we need to play this now. And a couple of them had played Flesh and Blood. One of them was pretty into Flesh and Blood like I was. And one of them hadn't really played Flesh and Blood at all. Big into the MTG scene. Mm. And they all adored it. So it, it works a little bit differently to Commander. You don't attack everyone. You sort of attack to your left and right. And it makes it more strategic. But all of that same level of politics and, and sort mm. of that, those, that tense decision making it's definitely like a casual way to play Flesh and Blood. I think, you know, the true competitive way to play it is one-on-one. -on -one. But, you know, there's like most of the TCGs in the space don't even have like a multiplayer format to even well, compare yeah, it to, yeah. right? Like Magic is definitely leading the space when it comes to social casual play um, in multiplayer yeah. scenarios. Every now and then I, I, I get the itch of Commander. I'm not the biggest Commander player in the whole world. Like, we'll, we'll probably come back to this whole topic about Commander, my thoughts on, on Commander in a separate video. So. If we ever get to it, just, just like click on one of these corners here, I'll, I'll drop it there um, and you can watch that whole video. But yeah, every now and then, multiplayer in casual formats are fun. When it comes down to it, Flesh and Blood is supposed to be played one-on-one. -on -one, so keep that in mind when, when, when you pick up this game as well. Thank you so much for watching our top five TCGs. I hope you enjoyed this window into our thoughts on the whole space. What are your top five TCGs? Do you play a TCG regularly? If not, why? Tell us in the comments below. Also, if you want to help the channel, like and subscribe and check out the Gathering Games website where we stock all of these TCGs and much, much more. GG. Gathering Games, eh? it's a cool place. Yeah, it's cool. It's a nice <laughs> shop, man. It's the first time I've been here. Nothing like in the pictures. <laughs>